And it was both enlightening and alarming to talk to these folks because they've always depended on America as this uh, citadel of, of democratic stability that leads the way in the world. And all of them aren't sure that that's the case anymore. They're not sure that uh, they can still rely on America. We have an anecdote in the book of Angela Merkel uh, at a breakfast with, with Kamala Harris in 21 saying, can we still count uh, on America? And I, we just haven't faced uh, those kinds uh, of questions before. Uh, and we certainly uh, are today. And Great. Well, I'd like to um, welcome everyone to the uh, AmCham's of Asia Pacific uh, virtual door knock. This is our uh, fifth one, uh, and we are thrilled to have with us uh, Jonathan Martin. Um, my name is Steve Oaken. I'm chair of, of AmCham's of, of Asia Pacific, uh, also a senior advisor uh, at McQuarrie Associates. Um, Jonathan is the author, co-author of This Will Not Pass. Um, the book we're going to discuss today. Um, what did your reporting, you know, indicate to you? Um, what is it that we should be thinking about, and and how should we be um, understanding this as Americans who are who are living overseas? Well, first of all, Steve, thanks for having me, and thanks to all of you for um, getting up and uh, and spending uh, your morning uh, with me. Um, I appreciate uh, all that you do, and uh, enjoyed visiting with some of you uh, when when you guys were in in DC. Uh, last month. Look, I've been covering politics now for nearly 20 years, and uh, th these are really sobering times uh, in America. Um, you know, I think, as you know, I mean, our democracy faced what was effectively a stress test the last couple of years, and that's at the heart of our book. We originally were going to do a campaign book, and the concept was this is going to be a fascinating campaign. We should really dig in and do a memorable book. But it became pretty obvious to us in 2020. And then damn clear uh, after the election was over uh, that we had to go bigger, that that we couldn't just sort of capture the campaign, that we were living through you know, a great challenge to our democratic system. And of course, never was that more clear than on January 6th. And I was in the Capitol on January 6th and experienced that firsthand. Uh, being evacuated with the, with the Senate, and I can talk about that a little bit more uh, later. Uh, but look, the, the bedrock of American democracy is the peaceful of transfer of power and its responsible, graceful losers. Uh, democracy depends upon losers uh, doing the right thing, conceding, bowing out, not contesting the election, and letting us all move on with the new government. And that, that was the case, for obviously, for, for over two centuries until, um, until 2020. And, uh, you know, it, guys, in a lot of ways, uh, 2020 never ended. And we're still living through uh, the sort of after effects of 2020. Um, these are deeply polarized times. Uh, we're, we're in a you know profoundly tribal uh, era, in which you know people are living in sort of competing uh, you know uh, partisan silos, and never the two shall meet, and that is creating obviously enormous tensions uh, between uh, the two parties and and testing our democracy. It, it's a really uh, unsettling time uh, because you've got you know, extremists who are now, uh, you know, being more and more radicalized, frankly. And what worries me the most is the, the normalizing of political uh, violence. And we see that creeping into our democracy. And I think the, the really alarming part about January 6th is that the prospect that it wasn't the culmination of events after the election, but rather was one more grim milestone uh, uh, in our country's sort of uh, you know devolution toward um, you know tribal conflict. I uh, I don't have to tell you because you've seen this from afar, but you know increasingly there there are uh, death threats uh, against major American politicians. You know Liz Cheney, <clears throat> who just lost her primary in Wyoming. You know was not able to really campaign in Wyoming in part 
not entirely, but in part because she faced so many death threats and she's had uh, a Capitol Police detail now for a year uh, following her around. As many of you know who've worked in politics, uh, it's very rare for a rank and file member of Congress to have a full-time uh, security detail, but that has become uh, increasingly uh, common. Um, and you know, look, I, I think the concerns about the U.S. being on the brink of a civil war, you know, at the moment are a, a tad overheated. But what is clear is that more and more people uh, who are engaged in politics are are being radicalized. Okay. Uh, a sense that the opposition isn't just you know wrong, but illegitimate. And I think uh, that's a dangerous place for us. Uh, politically when we view the opposition as, as somehow illegitimate. I'll, I'll just end I'll just end with this. We um, we talked to a lot of people for this book who were American allies. <clears throat> Tony Blair, the former Prime Minister of the UK, uh, Bob Ray, who's the Canadian ambassador to the UN, a longtime friend of America, Malcolm Turnbull, who most of you know was of course the Prime Minister of Australia and somebody who was sort of traditional center-right party in Australia. And it was both enlightening and alarming to talk to these folks because they've always depended on America as this uh, citadel of, of democratic stability that leads the way in the world. And all of them aren't sure that that's the case anymore. They're not sure that uh, they can still rely on America. We have an anecdote in the book of Angela Merkel uh, at a breakfast with, with Kamala Harris in 21 saying, can we still count uh, on America? And I, we just haven't faced uh, those kinds uh, of questions before. Uh, and we certainly uh, are today. And you know, one of the things I think, Jonathan, to, to follow up uh, from our uh, meeting in in Washington, and it seems like it was, you know, months and months ago, because so much yeah. has happened in in the you know in the month and change since we've met. I mean, we've had two major developments. One, you've had the the FBI search of of Mar-a-Lago um, yeah. and the the Trump and, and and Republican for the most part, you know, Republican reaction there yeah. too. And then you, on the other hand, you had the passage of the. Uh, you know, Inflation Reduction Act, uh, yeah. which is a, a major piece of good news. Uh, so how do you see what's happened lately between those two things uh, affecting um, our it, democracy? It reminds me of that memorable and perhaps the only memorable thing he ever said, but, but John Edwards' line about the two Americas, right? Um, we're, we're sort of living with a world in which, you know, suddenly the Congress has actually been somewhat functional and even productive. And they've moved bipartisan legislation the last um, year, and year and a half. And Biden signed a lot of significant uh, bills. And so in some ways, and from one angle, the government actually has, oh, the system can still work. And sort of Biden has been able to fulfill his vow to make Washington work again. That's kind of the glass is half full perspective, but it's so overshadowed, Steve, as you know, because what dominates the room, what sucks up so much oxygen is not the machinery of government. It's not uh, the typical Washington question of, oh, you know, the president and his party are in the majority and they had a pretty productive Congress. What does that mean for the midterms? There's still those questions of that we've sort of traditionally uh, known so well but it's overwhelmed and it's sort of crowded out of the room by the much larger uh, matter of American democracy and the health of our democracy. And look no further than obviously the last president's residence being raided by the FBI because he took classified documents with them and won't give them back. I mean, that, that tells you pretty uh, concisely the challenges that we're facing. Um, you know, I'll just, uh, remind you guys briefly, if you haven't read the book, I'd hope you pick it up. You can get it on Amazon. There's a link uh, that we, we put in the chat. Um, my co-author, Alex and I, and I wish he was here tonight with me. He's a fantastic friend and colleague. He and I went to Mar-a-Lago 
in the spring of 21 to interview the former president. And to sort of get to my you know, in a larger point here about how, why this moment feels different, all of us on this call would be familiar with the archetype that greeted uh, Alex and I as we approached Mar-a-Lago. Uh, exiled strongman leader uh, at his uh, you know, tropical uh, mansion, plotting his return to the Capitol, uh, asking visiting journalists uh, what was happening back there, uh, what was happening with the opposition party that was now in power. And it was immediate, that sensation of, oh, I know what this is. And I read about this uh, archetype. I just never seen it or experienced in my country, but it's all too familiar. And I think that goes to the heart of so much what we're dealing with now, whether it's how the former president is operating, how he refused to concede the election, what happened on the 6th, or his presidency and frankly, his rise to power generally. It's this failure of imagination that we've had uh, in, in our country to recognize that yes, it can happen to us. There's nothing in the water in America that makes us immune to the appeal of strongman politics, right? Um, and I think we were deluding ourselves to think that it couldn't happen here. It's happened you know, all over the world. And I think uh, you know, part of the shock to the system was that, um, oh, wow, you know, those similar demagogic uh, appeals could work in the U.S. with the American electorate. We shouldn't have been that surprised. And I think you can sort of uh, take that, 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 that lack of imagination uh, all the way through the present uh, when it comes to how we judge uh, this moment, because we're just, um, we've been so blissfully removed. Uh, from that kind of struggle that so many countries go through when it comes to their leadership and trying to retain their democracy. Is there is the Republican Party ever going to break with Trump? I mean, if, if, the, if the Republicans lose the Senate again right. uh, now when when historically they should not, is, is that yeah. going to cause a future or is this over for, for are we with is Trump going to be the leader of the Republican Party for the foreseeable future? This is the question that, that they grapple with every day now. <laughs> I can tell you and this may sound um, this may sound uh, excessively blunt, but I, I hear from the party every day. Republicans are beside themselves that they're still having to basically live a lie. They're having to fake it. Uh, mainstream Republicans, donors, lawmakers, party strategists, the kind of uh, elites of the party uh, have to pretend that they like Donald Trump, want him to be the leader of the party when the opposite is true, all right? Uh, if There's a reason why in the days after the, the January 6th, as we chronicle in the book, uh, people like Kevin McCarthy, Mitch McConnell, view this as their liberation day. Here was their opportunity to break free. And they, they saw him as an anchor, as an albatross. And, uh, you know, obviously McCarthy was back to Mar-a-Lago before January was up. Why? Because they realized their voters hadn't moved on. Their voters still liked it. And that's the story of these times in the Republican Party. The leaders are basically following the will of their voters, and their voters are uh, still besotted by Trump, a lot of them. What's it going to take, Stephen, for that to break? You know, there's not a lot of optimism among the sort of old guard that it, it's going to happen anytime soon. Now, I do think that you'll see a more assertive call after the midterms when there's nothing to lose anymore, at least in the short term, among some traditional Republicans. That mm -hmm. Trump has the reverse Midas touch uh, that, you know, starting in 2018 with the House, uh, he lost the House, the White House, the Senate, and now could doom his party's chances of reclaiming the Senate. You know, I think you could hold up that record if you're a Republican after the midterms and make the case that that, that Trump uh, you know, politically uh, has really undermined the party that he purports to lead. Now, are the voters that he that like him, the voters that like him, going to want to hear that? I mean, I think that's an open question, right? And this gets to the heart of the Republican problem. It's not just a Trump issue, right? They have a demand side issue, all right? Their voters 
like Trump and Trumpism. There's a reason why in the midterm primaries so far this year, a lot of sort of Trumpish candidates have gotten the nomination. This is what appeals now to a lot of Republican voters. It's a profoundly different uh, party now, Steve. Okay, um, Adam, you have a question. Um, thank you, Steve. And uh, Jonathan, it was great seeing you last month in DC and thanks again for spending time with us today. Thank you. Um, and I hope everyone goes out there and reads your book. Um, it is fascinating. I, I, I note um, listening to your talk that you know we live in this hyper partisan era, but it seems that the the only things that have happened recently that aren't extremely partisan are both very related to Asia. Um, one is is the Chips Act um, that passed recently, yeah. and the other uh, was maybe how people felt about um, Nancy Pelosi's visit to Taiwan. Yeah. And so I guess my question in this is a, is a China question, and that's yeah. that. If, if the China issue is not very partisan in the U.S., do you expect that the, uh, that the China issue will have a major role in these midterm elections or the upcoming, uh, the next presidential election? Yeah, it's a great question. I, and you can just sense it in the ether back uh, in the States that China is growing and growing as a, a, a domestic political issue. Uh, and a potential looming national security threat in both parties. You can just feel it changing. Um, obviously, Putin invading the Ukraine has sort of interrupted that for the time being, but boy, did the Pelosi trip really reignite the China question. And I think you're absolutely right, Adam, that you know, were it not for the, the, the concerns about an assertive Beijing, that chip bill would not have passed. Uh, like it did with the bipartisan votes that it commanded. I think the 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 potential threat uh, of of uh, you know China uh, hostilities against Taiwan was a huge driver uh, in getting that bill done. And the sense in the Republican Party that we have to be tough about about China has become a real article of faith. And what's striking is. You don't see that sort of unity in the Republican Party when it comes to Ukraine and the you know uh, massive amounts of money that the government is spending on Ukraine aid. Back in May, as some of you probably saw, one of the the bills to authorize the spending of the Ukrainian aid. There were eleven dissenters in the Senate for that for that aid bill, and all eleven were Republicans, and most of them uh, uh, elected the last couple of cycles. So there, there is a younger, newer, more populist, anti-interventionist wing of the Republican Party, certainly when it comes to Europe, when it comes to um, aiding Ukraine, but you don't see that necessarily when it comes to, um, to, to the, the China uh, and Taiwan uh, issue, uh, which is which is striking, and I, I frankly was surprised that there was no daring Republican member of Congress who uh, tried to sign up to go with Pelosi uh, when she visited Taiwan. Because I thought uh, that could have been a real p a PR opportunity for a Republican. Because boy, if there's one issue where you can lock arms with Nancy Pelosi and the Republican Party, it's 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 stepping off a U.S. government plane onto a, uh, you know, a tarmac in Taipei, that's for sure. All right, so that was Adam in Vietnam. Next up is Glenn in Singapore. Glenn. Thanks, Steve. Thanks for organizing this. So thank you, Jonathan. Uh, Jonathan, the, the current divide in politics, I think, in the modern era can be traced back in, in large part to uh, the Gingrich moral majority Republicans of the 90s and how they went after Clinton. And then, of course, the Bush ne Bush two neocons uh, with the Iraq war. You're with us. You're against us. That sort of rhetoric. Um, how much of that do you look at in your book, the historic perspective on how we yeah. got to Trump? Yeah. Um, and because this is not this is not simply a Trump administration or a yeah. Trump era problem. This goes back farther and is probably more intractable than many people think. Yeah, Trump is the accelerant. Uh, and social media is uh, the kind of uh, runway uh, uh, for this. Uh, but there's no question that uh, this is an old story. Uh, I've heard it traced back to Gingrich in 94. I've heard it traced back to, to Bork, uh, uh, the Bork fight uh, at the Supreme Court. 
But certainly the, the sort of roots of our polarization go back beyond Trump. He just had a showman's gift to tap into it and a demagogue's touch uh, when it came to being able uh, to sort of pick that scab, uh, pardon the metaphor, uh, 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 here in America, he sort of knew all all of the sort of uh, sensitive spots in the American body politic. Uh, you know, for all the criticism uh, about his style, he he does have that that sort of feral uh, sensibility to him when it comes to um, uh, rallying voters and a willingness to sort of go further than polite company uh, ever has in American politics. And I, I come back to that failure of imagination, just the idea that it couldn't happen here. Look, he called for banning Muslims in November of 2015, okay? And so like, why was anybody surprised that he acted the way he did it and that he wouldn't, he wouldn't concede the election? I'll, I'll say one more thing about this because your, your question about the history uh, has been on my mind quite a bit recently. Uh, I've spent a lot of time in Wyoming, uh, of all places, uh, the last month. And as most of you know, there's worse places in America to be uh, than, than Wyoming uh, in August. I, I did not ask for combat pay for this mission. Uh, <laughs> uh, the paper, uh, paper said uh, that, uh, that was not going to be uh, in the offing. But seriously, I, I talked to Liz Cheney at great length. And I, I was really curious because she grew up in politics and her dad was in the house from 78 until uh, 80, uh, 89 when he became Secretary of Defense. And she grew up in that world. And then of course she herself worked in the Bush 43 administration and then was a Fox commentator. People forget that. She was on Fox in the Obama years, was a guest host for Sean Hannity. And it really incendiary rhetoric toward toward Obama back then. And I asked her, I said, do you have any kind of regrets about the role that, that you played in sort of offering the kindling for where we are now? Because I, I know that she's been in a more reflective mood and you know, what was striking and to her credit, she she said that, that she had been guilty of sort of, um, I think her phrase was, you know, knee jerk, uh, hyper partisan reaction and sort of, um, uh, and she did have some regrets uh, about that. And, and I think um, you know, she's been radicalized by what happened after the election and by the sixth, but it was striking to me and to, to get to your question that, that e even somebody like that uh, was starting to think about, you know, how did we get here? Because it didn't just start when Trump took the oath uh, in January, 2017. Uh, it obviously began uh, much sooner much sooner than than that, and of course, social media has has made this so much easier because we can just happily live in our own our own silos here in the states. Maybe, what, Ma'am Jonathan, just going to ask one one follow up to to that. Um, yeah. you, we we see a lot of current unhappiness, right, on both sides of the aisle. I yeah. mean, even you know, obviously Republicans with with Trump, but Democrats who say, you know, I think a majority, at least of some polls, say Biden should not run um, yeah. for for a second term. Um, what a remarkable so, time. Yeah. And so with that, what's the potential? Uh, and, and this is a question our friend, your friend, my boss, Mac McLarty, uh, asked me to ask you. Uh, what's the potential of a third way? Not necessarily a third party candidate, but a third yeah. way if Biden and Trump run against each other. And as that follow-up, what's, what's the role Liz Cheney might play? Uh, yeah. All of this. What, what, what's so interesting about these times is that never in modern history have the parties structurally been weaker and never have leaders had less clout, less, less tools, less levers uh, to work. Uh, fundraising has been democratized. You know, uh, committee assignments and earmarks don't have the same swat they used to have. Party bosses don't really exist anymore. It's a much flatter, small d democratic operation. But paradoxically, never has partisanship been so intense. So weak parties, strong partisanship. I don't want to sound too much like a poli sci professor mm -hmm. this early in the morning. But what I mean by that is, um, that is pretty forbidding when it comes to a third party possibility, because while the parties are weak and while a lot of people don't like the possibility of a Trump-Biden rematch, partisanship is so damn strong 
but it's negative partisanship, which is a poli-sci term. And what that means is you're, you're driven by your disdain for the opposition, not an affirmative case for your own party, but what compels you is a fear, hate, dread uh, of the other side. And I think be, that force is so strong in both parties. With Republicans, they, they, they loathe the left and the perceived excesses of the left. And obviously, Democrats have uh, the great uh, mobilizer, organizer, unifier, Donald J. Trump, which sort of coheres their coalition. And so I think because of that hatred of the other, there's just so few voters who I think would be willing to risk helping the side they hate the most by voting for a third party. Because if you vote for a third party, you know, you're trying to help somebody else beyond the, the folks that you're not very excited about, but you don't want to help the folks you, uh, the person you hate the most, right? And I think that's what makes it, you know, obviously there's ballot access challenges that are mechanical. I think the larger issue is just the sort of tribal times that we're in that, you know, if you are a centrist in this country, and your choices are Biden and Trump, you don't necessarily want Biden to be president for four more years, but you're probably not undecided on Trump. You probably really don't want Trump, right? And so do you vote for a third party and risk helping Trump? And I think to your question about Liz Cheney, this is what she's thinking through. You know, do I get in the race as a third party candidate? And if I do that, is that only helping the Trump's help, right? Because who is the voter that, you know, is going to vote for me instead of Trump, right? Who's the voter who is sort of like, who who is deducting a vote from the Trump tally by voting for me? Probably nobody, right? And so I think that's the challenge. All right, next up, uh, Lynn in Indonesia. Okay. I, I look at the U.S. and it's extremely fractured. There's no common set of facts that we agree on uh, right. as we used to. Right. Uh, there's no, there, there is no daily paper. That's right. Um, you know, it's Facebook. There is, yep. it's, it's whatever you want it to yep. be. You know, I can read the New York Times every day and pretend that everybody else is reading it, but they're not. Correct. And as, as, we're, as we're increasingly splintered into these silos yeah. of, of information and in many cases disinformation, I think that this leads to one conclusion that a number of people are writing about. The U.S. is in eclipse as a world power. The post-World War II consensus is yeah. over. Uh, we may still be the biggest economy, but we're not able to command the globe the way the U.S. used to think it could yeah. anyway. And my, my question then is, what, what do you see coming? If there is a, a truly multipolar world uh, that emerges out of all this political chaos in the United States, and if the United States perhaps looks less yeah. sensible to the rest yeah. of the world. What what do you think comes next? And, and I well, do read the New York Times every day. <laughs> well, God love you for doing that. May, may your tribe increase. Look, I, you're right. Uh, we are returning to more of a 19th century model of political tribalism. Uh, the post-war consensus, both on culture and politics and media of you know, uh, pardon the football expression, but we're uh, headed towards September here, so uh, tis the season. But we were operating within the 40-yard lines of American life, and there were strong incentives because we had a sort of collective uh, popular culture, and we had uh, a media culture which rewarded, uh, uh, you know, uh, moderation. Uh, because advertisers <laughs> like moderation, and they 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 wanted to appeal to the broadest possible audience. Um, and I think that we're just sort of back to the future, if you will, uh, to a 19th century model of different versions of of, uh, uh, of reality. And, um, you know, because of that, um, we're, we're not able to kind of project uh, the kind of consensus uh, that, uh, that we had for, for so many years. Um, look, one of the things that we talk about in the book and that was so, so depressing is, you know, the history of this country, at least in modern times, is we typically are galvanized and unified by crisis. The Great Depression, world wars, uh, you know, the constant threat of uh, the sort of Soviets, uh, you know, all of that, you know, obviously in more recent times, uh, uh, 
you know, terrorism acted at least momentarily and sometimes longer than that as a force for unification. Here we had a awful domestic crisis, a global crisis, obviously, that, that we were living here, the worst pandemic in a century. And what did it do? It didn't bring people together. It further exacerbated the cancer, right? The cancer metastasized, uh, the cancer of polarization, right? Everything got political. Masks, vaccines, Fauci, it all became more and more logs on the blazing fire of our polarization. And we talk about that. And then that was a really eye-opening moment for a lot of people of Jesus, even a pandemic, which everybody is living through, can't bring us together. It's driving us further apart. And the reason it's driving us further apart is precisely what you said. We don't have shared facts. We don't operate from the same conversation. We don't agree on the basics. And when you don't have a, a sort of set of shared facts, it's hard to sustain uh, a democracy. And I think a good follow-up. This is the real downer here, have... guys. Sorry about this. I'm going to give you some good news here eventually. I don't know. Peter's question is a good follow-up to that. I don't know if we're going to get more good news from you on this one. Peter, in Bangkok. Hi. Yeah, I'm uh, uh, here in Bangkok. I, I co-chair the uh, AmCham Thailand Digital Economy Committee. Um, <clears throat> my question is, uh, you know, you talked about the uh, uh, how Republicans are, you know, being driven by this fear of, you know, the, the voter base and having to uh, uh, follow them. Well, what about, to, to what extent can you ascribe some of the problem to the media which okay is following the almighty dollar by uh you know focusing and by uh pandering to an audience which you know regardless of whether you're talking about totally Fox or some other i mean it's you totally know the uh, what happened to the fairness doctrine for example no, totally I mean, fair. look when when people complain about the media what is so striking to me here in the states is that immediately what comes out of their mouth is some reference to television news. And I think a lot of Americans believe that, quote, the media, uh, you know, air quotes here, is the sort of partisan, tilted cable network that is fresh in their mind. And of course, that's not the media. I mean, the biggest force in the media is the Associated Press, which has bureaus all over the world, including, including all the countries where you're sitting today. But, you know, the people associate of, uh, you know, the media, look, I, I, you know, appear on CNN, I'm an analyst, I'm, I love doing that, and it, it's a fantastic platform, but when I talk to people, they connect me with seeing me talk ab about politics on CNN for five, ten minutes, uh, not the sort of hours and hours that I put into my stories as a print journalist, because they believe the media is television, that's part of the problem, but look, I'll be candid with you. If tomorrow the New York Times never wrote the words Marjorie Taylor Greene again, she would still have a following. She would still have a platform. It, it, look, I would love to believe that we were still in an era where the media could you know, flip a switch and we were gatekeepers and you know Time Newsweek and the 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 you know Post, the New York Times, and the Journal set the agenda. But guys, I mean. Those days are gone. All right, there's no gatekeepers anymore. And the fact is that the biggest forces now are social media and the algorithms that can dictate whatever people uh, want to see. T to your point, you know, there's no daily paper in the driveway. There's no cron cut at 6:30. People are getting information around the clock uh, on their phones, on their tablets. Uh, and it's not just from news organizations, it's, it's social media. They're barraged with information. They're swimming in information. And, you know, they have to decide what's legit and what's not. And of course, they're going to pick what reinforces their preconceived notions as the legit stuff. And we can't control that in the press. Are, look, are there problems with the media? Do we reward, uh, and, and, you know, people who are more provocative, who are sort of, uh, you know, lighting their hair on fire and sort of quietly getting the chips bill done. That's a totally fair critique. I, I think you can complain uh, about that. And especially when it comes to the TV press, which is not going to do in-depth segments on how the chips bill got done, but is going to do a segment on Donald Trump, you know, misspelling whatever. And like, you know, <laughs> saying that uh, windmills kill birds. Okay. Uh, fair enough. But what I'm saying is like the bigger challenge we have this 
runaway train that we can't control now. This is so gloomy. I'm sorry. Can I just offer some good news here? Because uh, I don't want to send all of you guys to the rest of your day here, uh, uh, believing that the American experiment is coming to a halt uh, after a pretty good two plus century run. Look, what's great about our country, uh, as those of you who know history can appreciate, is that we have gotten it wrong so many times and we typically get it wrong and then we eventually get it right. The the long arc of our country uh, is one of, of forward motion. I just appeared over the weekend at the Mississippi Book Festival, which is a huge uh, affair uh, at the state capitol in Jackson. And to the great credit of Mississippi, they have a brand new civil rights museum that the state and private sector paid for. It is unsparing, it's raw, and it's really disturbing because you realize that these murders, you know, Emmett Till, Cheney, Schwerner, and Goodman, this happened not terribly long ago. Um, you know, people like, um, um, uh, uh, I'm forgetting his name now, um, but people were, were killed in the movement in the 60s and 70s. Their kids are still pretty young. I raised that because you realize that that you know, obviously was a huge black eye in the history of America, but we made progress. I was thinking of Medgar Evers. Uh, we made progress and obviously we've passed laws and we've people's hearts have changed and we, we've sort of gotten to a better place in the country in the last 50 years. It wasn't easy. There was opposition, but obviously we're now in a better place. I just raised that because it does offer something, some hope in the long term. I think in the short to medium run, we're in for a lot of polarization, a lot of conflict, and I fear more political violence. Well, maybe Jonathan, to, to, to talk about, you know, as that leads into the midterms, you sound, yeah. I think, a lot maybe like Ron Klain, who says, look, we're doing all these great things. The White House is accomplishing all of this. Look what's happening. You mentioned the CHIPS Act. You talk about uh, having, you know, the first African-American woman ever yeah. on the Supreme Court. You talk about uh, gun control legislation right. passing for the first time since the 90s, the in, you know Infrastructure uh, Act. Um, everything that was included of the largest climate bill the United States has ever done in its history. So, so you do have a lot of good things happening, but it seems to all be doom and gloom. I mean, can the Democrats get that message out or is because that pe not people, right? People don't feel that. They don't feel that in their own lives yet. They, they, they hear about it vaguely, but they don't feel that change in their own lives. The, the two the best pieces of news for Democrats this summer have nothing to do with all that stack of accomplishments you just mentioned. The best pieces of news are gas is coming down, uh, you know, driving Mississippi and Louisiana. I can tell you gas is now you know, 350 a gallon, uh, which is dramatically lower than it was a couple of months ago, where it was five bucks everywhere you went. That's a huge deal for the American consumer. And then secondly, because we're in this era of negative partisanship that I mentioned earlier, the best thing Democrats have going for them is the continued role of Donald Trump in American politics, his dominance of the Republican Party, as illustrated by his propelling candidates who were out of the mainstream to the nomination in a series of governor's races and Senate races. Democrats can talk about their accomplishments all they want. They will. I get it. But if you put them on truth serum, they would acknowledge that what they have going for them is being able to run against the Republicans once again as Trump beholden extremist in a handful of critical states. And today's American politics, that's how you win elections, you know, not by touting your politics. So. And, and Douglas had a, had a question about Donald Trump. And since I, you're probably the only one on the Zoom who's I've heard of him, a, yeah. a yeah. one hour conversation with him, we'd love to get your insights, Douglas. Yeah. Okay, well, my question is this. Why do you think Trump took the classified documents? I've seen this question in the press repeatedly, but I haven't really seen any, an answer. And why does he refuse to turn them over when he was specifically asked to do so? Like oh, well, that's easy. Uh, oh, okay. Thank you. Be, because he wanted to, because he, he just <laughs> thought they were his and, and liked them. When, when we interviewed Trump in April of 21, he referred because we asked him a question. We said, have you stayed in touch with, with, with any foreign leaders since you left the White House? And we were curious who he had heard from. And he volunteered that he had gotten like a really nice note from, from uh, Kim Jong-un. And, uh, and in fact, we said, oh, we'd love to see that. And he told the staffer there, he said, oh, can you make sure that these guys get a copy? Now, of course, they never followed up on that. And you know, we never <laughs> copy it. If we did, uh, you would have seen that in the book. Uh, uh, but he was very candid about the fact that, you know, he, he had gotten that. 
And he's not a conventional American president. He doesn't think, oh, well, this is classified. Therefore, when I leave and go back to private life, I have to turn it over to the archives. It's this it matters to me. Maybe it's kind of hot, like I'm going to keep this. And, and if we're being totally candid, I think he likes the idea of being able to either A, show it off down the road, or B, potentially sell it or market it down the road, <laughs> right? I mean, that's the thing. It's like, he's a salesman at, at heart. And so I think that, but I think the easiest, the, the easiest explanation is it's just the impulse. Like he wanted to keep it. He thought it was his, uh, the end. Um, that, you know, he just, he, he, he broke so many norms because he, he doesn't think that way. Uh, that's, that's just how he, how he operates on, on so many levels. And I think I come back to that sort of lack of imagination about how he operates and who he is. Uh, we just keep being shocked that we shouldn't be, you know. And this is what we get in the book. Whether it's the aftermath of January 6th, where McConnell does not rally to find 17 Republicans and convict Trump, or whether it's later in the year where they say we can't do a bipartisan commission on one sex because he's going to get mad. He doesn't want it. In both cases, by refusing to confront Trump and by just hoping you could placate him, they ultimately hurt their cause. And this is what we get in the book. Whether it's the aftermath of January 6th, where McConnell does not rally to find 17 Republicans and convict Trump, or whether it's later in the year where they say we can't do a bipartisan commission on one sex because he's going to get mad, he doesn't want it. In both cases, by refusing to confront Trump and by just hoping you could placate him, they ultimately hurt their cause politically nevertheless, right? Uh, Trump still has influenced the midterms, and he's still pushing candidates through that could hurt the Republican cause. And when it comes to the 1-6 commission, because they didn't cooperate and they sort of torpedoed the bipartisan commission, they've now hurt themselves by, by because there is this now sort of very clearly, uh, you know, built in commission politically, nevertheless, right? Uh, Trump still has influenced the midterms and he's still pushing candidates through that could hurt the Republican cause. And when it comes to the 1-6 commission, because they didn't cooperate and they sort of torpedoed the bipartisan commission, they've now hurt themselves by, by because there is this now sort of very clearly uh, you know, built in commission. The, the bigger question is Mitch McConnell, okay? If he tries to find 17 votes and they convict Trump, and then immediately after that, like with every impeachment, they then vote to bar him from holding office in the future. If they do that, that's a tough vote, but that's it. Trump cannot run for office again. And all these questions today, about 24, are null and void because he cannot run again. Now, McConnell privately believed that if, if they did that, and I think that he didn't think the, the votes were there, but, you know, could he have tried? McConnell thought if they did that, Trump would torpedo the party in the midterms and spend the rest of his living days. Uh, the, the bigger question is Mitch McConnell, okay? If he tries to find 17 votes and they convict Trump, and then immediately after that, like with every impeachment, they then vote to bar him from holding office in the future. If they do that, that's a tough vote, but that's it. Trump cannot run for office again. And all these questions today, about 24, are null and void because he cannot run again. Now, McConnell privately believed that if, if they did that, and I think that he didn't think the, the votes were there, but, you know, could he have tried? McConnell thought if they did that, Trump would torpedo the party in the midterms and spend the rest of his living days uh, trying to get even with the Republican Party. And by the way, this echo is pressed Basically what happened in 15 and 16, the Republican Party was so nervous about Trump running as a third party candidate or torpedo on the party that they, we can't do that. We have to placate him otherwise will hurt us. So this is now seven years of conflict avoidance with Trump for fear he's going to damage the party. But the great irony, of course, is that they didn't pursue the conviction and he still may undermine them in the midterms by virtue of the candidates that he got through the primaries. And I think that would be a bracing lesson 
uh, trying to get even with the Republican Party. And by the way, this echo is precisely what happened in 15 and 16. The Republican Party was so nervous about Trump running as a third party candidate or torpedo on the party that they, we can't do that. We have to placate him. Otherwise, will hurt us. So this is now seven years of conflict avoidance with Trump for fear he's going to damage the party. But the great irony, of course, is that they didn't pursue the conviction, and he still may undermine them in the midterms by virtue of the candidates that he got through the primaries. And I think that would be a bracing lesson for Mitch McConnell, who's now 80, wants to be a majority leader again, that by avoiding that conflict, you still may not get, regain the majority uh, once again. Okay, well, we're, we're coming to the end of our hour. So again, I just want to say, Boom. here's a, buy this book. Don't wait for the paperback. But John, my, my closing <laughs> question. It's on Amazon now. I know they deliver all over Asia, man. If not, we'll get Bezos uh, tracked down for you. Make sure he goes that last mile. So my closing question, when the paperback comes out next year, I guess it'll come out next year. Yeah. What is the best case scenario? We know the worst case scenario, but what's the best case scenario when you write the next few chapters next year for your book? What, what's the best case scenario that we can look at? Look, I, we're in a remarkable time in American politics where the two parties are basically having to operate different and publicly than they do in private. And in both cases, it's around Donald J. Trump. The Republican Party leadership would prefer Donald Trump to fall into a sinkhole tomorrow and would never deal with him again. In public, they have to pretend otherwise, but I can tell you from interviewing people at the highest levels of the Republican Party, they don't want Trump to be their nominee again, and they're desperately hoping he won't be, and they want him to go away. The Democratic Party in public believes that Trump's a cancer and threatens American democracy. In private, they said, say, we don't know what we do without him. He's their best organizer, their best unifier, their best vote mobilizer, and yes, their, their best fundraiser too. And so these are incredibly uh, fascinating and perhaps cynical times in American politics where the two parties uh, are, are projecting very different things uh, about uh, a former president who still looms so large over the, the political scene here in America. So to answer your question, maybe in 23, we'll have a little bit more uh, honesty in public. Uh, about the former president uh, when it comes to the two parties and how they actually feel about him. I'm not holding my breath about that. There's a reason why Profiles and Courage was a pretty slim volume. Uh, <laughs> uh, but I think, uh, I, you know, we'll see. I, I do believe, Steve, that a, 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 a really um, disappointing midterm could liberate some people in the Republican Party to say publicly what they certainly say in private uh, about Trump, because they'll have prima facie evidence that once again, uh, he undermined their cause. Uh, and if they aren't willing to do it after the midterms, they may not have a chance again because he could be the nominee again. Well, Jonathan, thank you so much for from all of us for, for spending this hour with thank us. Thank you. We, we really, really appreciate it and look forward to, to getting together with you again some sometime down the road. Well, thanks for, for all that, that, that you guys do. And um, uh, please do pick up a copy of the book, I'd be, I'd be grateful. And if you have any other questions or follow-ups, um, I'm going to drop my email address in the chat here. And you can just, just drop me a line. Thanks, guys. Thanks, everybody. Thank you.